Amen. Amen. I tell you what, I'm just so excited about Jesus. I'm excited about this time that we are living in. And you might be saying, Pastor Charles, well, so much stuff is going on. But you know what? Jesus is still on the throne. He is still the Lord of Lords. He is still in control. Amen. Listen, on December 1st, we, we started a, a, a great devotional, some writings by, we, we, we have some talented pastors here at this church. I, I just want to give each of them a great big round of applause. They, they're dedicated men and women. They love the Lord. They love the people of God. And they, they sought the Lord and they allowed God to use them to, to really share from their heart some Advent devotionals. And, and it's really been a blessing. Hopefully it's been a blessing to you. Um, and we, what we wanted to do was just to encourage you as we move forward toward Christmas Day and celebrating the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You may be recalling that we started with this question. You know, the question was this, what does, you know, when you hear someone say Jesus is the reason for the season, the question has been, what does that mean to you? Because that's something that we all have to contemplate. We all have to answer that question. We all have to think about what that means for us. And I'm hoping that over the past 20 days, you know, counting today, that, that you've begun to get some clarity with regards to what that means to you. Because each of us has to answer that question for themselves. And hopefully you've done that. Uh, uh, but for me, you know, it's, it's an individual thing, and, I, and I've really begun to, to, to realize some things during this time. You know, I, I, I serve the Lord, and I, I, I pray to Him, I read the Word, and I study, but I, I begun to really understand how much more we need Him in our lives. We need Him. Each of us needs Him. Whether you realize it or not, you need the Lord. And so, so and, and again, as I shared last time that I was before you, that was how, why, the reason why God put in my heart the, the, the focus for this season, which is reintroducing the Christ of Christmas. Because Jesus is not just the reason for the season. He's the reason for every season. It doesn't matter. He's the reason that we exist. We're the, he's the reason that we're here. He's the reason that we wake up every day. He's the reason that we have life and strength in our bodies. And so it's so important that we, we, we reiterate, you know, just how important he is, how important we focus, how important it is for us to focus in on the fact that Jesus is the reason. See, it's so easy for that to get lost. See, because every time we get, as a matter of fact, once you get past October 31st, you begin to see Christmas decorations. You begin to see Christmas trees and lights and commercials about gifts and Christmas. But in all of that and all the, the, the preparations of going out and trying to get gifts and doing all those things, getting, a, you know, the meal and the house decorated and all those things, the real reason sometimes gets forgotten, gets overlooked. We forget that Jesus is the reason. But in this year of 2020, <laughs> it's especially important that you realize that Jesus is the reason. Because this year has been a year like no other year. No other year. I, 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 and I'm sure that's the testimony of many of you. I, 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 look, I've been here 60 years, and I know that in my 60 years, it has been, this has been a year like no other year. And I know some of you that have been here longer than that can have, have the same testimony. And so, so what I mean, it, it, this has been different. This has been a year like no other. No other year. Listen, uh, 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 due to the current state of our economy, think about it. Normally right now, people are out going out and they're shopping and they're, the malls are packed, the shopping centers are full. You see people going up and down the streets. You see people coming out with bags and bags of, of gifts, you know, things that they've gone out and bought for people. But what you really see now when you look out there, you don't see the shopping malls overrun. You don't see uh, 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 the shopping centers and the parking lots all full. But what you see is people lined up in, in parking lots to get food. People are lined up right now because they don't have all the means, they don't have all the things they need to even make it 
to tomorrow. People are lined up for miles and miles and miles and miles just to get one bag of food because of the way things are right now in this United States of America and in the world. Look, normally you, we, we, we see people planning for these big meals and, and, and having these big gatherings in their homes, but because of the pandemic, you know, we don't gather like we used to gather. You know, we don't come together, even in our family settings where we have the big table spread and people are all over the place and people coming together who haven't come together in, in all, every year, they only look forward to coming together for that one time, but because of that, it is different. And if you don't realize that with all the things that we are facing right now, that Jesus, if Jesus is not the reason for your season, you, you need to stop and reevaluate because we need him even more now than we ever have. We need him. We need him. Listen, Jesus is not lost. Jesus is not somewhere where we can't find him. See, see, one of the most frustrating things uh, I can think of is, 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 is when you, when you be, to be looking for something everywhere. I mean, you're looking all over the place. You're trying to find, man, I know, I, I know it should be right there. I know, I, and, you, and it's frustrating because you know you got it, and you know you need it, and you're looking for it, but you can't find it. It kind of reminds me of uh, uh, one time my, my, my wife was, was looking for her glasses, and she was looking high and low, and I, and I finally, I'm noticing, like, honey, what's wrong? What did you lose? I, I'm trying to find my glasses. Honey, you got your glasses on. See, and that's how it is sometimes. We, we, we're so busy. We're so busy. Uh, 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 we think that we, we, it's lost. We think we can't find it. What we have or what we're looking for or what we think is lost is there all the time. It's not gone anywhere. You know, that's, and, and, and that's how it is right now, the way we're living, the way we're going through these things right now. You know, it seems like, where's God? Where is He? But you know what? He's still right here. He's still right here. And we have to realize that He's all we need. He's, he's the only thing we need. And we have to realize that even though we may not see Him moving, we may not feel that He's moving, guess what? Jesus is moving. He is working because He's not an idol God. See, I've learned some lessons over the past nine months. I've learned just how much I really need the Lord. See, because there have been some times that, that have been trying. There have been some times that have been pressing. There have been some situations that, that have, have caused me to, to say, oh God, I, I need you more. And I believe that's a testimony of many of us that we've been pressing in. But one of the greatest things I've learned even in this time was that God, He's still there. See, see, when, when, when the Scripture said that, 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 that His name is Emmanuel, meaning God with us, that was not just for a moment, but that's for our lifetime. That's for an eternity. That means that He's always with us. He is never gone. And that Emmanuel, that God with us, is the greatest gift. It's the greatest gift that's ever been given. There'll be no gift that can ever match it. And guess what? It's the greatest gift that you can ever receive. Now, all I want to encourage you to do is open up your gift. See, because, see, Jesus, Jesus is right there. The gift is right there for you. All you got to do is open up. You don't get gifts and just sit them in the corner and leave them wrapped up. No, you rip through that paper and you rip through the box and you get in there as quick as you can so you can see what it is. And that's what Jesus desires for us to do toward Him. He wants us to get just like we want to open that gift, just like we got that anticipation of, of just tearing that box open, that bag, and ripping that paper off, and it's so beautiful. The, I mean, the wrapping, sometimes we make it so beautiful, the bow is so perfect, but we rip it all apart. And Jesus is saying, yes, that's what I want you to do. I want you to just rip it all apart so I can come into your life and I can make your life brand new. Hallelujah. 
Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You can tell I'm excited about my Lord, and I want you to get excited about him too. Listen, the last time I was before you, I shared from Isaiah's uh, uh, prophetic word. He, he gave us an introduction of the Messiah. You know, he, 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 he was talking to the children of Israel. He was prophesying. He was letting them know, you know, I, you're going through some stuff. Look, they were going through some things. How many of you going through some things? I, I, I dare to say that most of us can raise our hand. You know, how many of you are going through some trials? How many of you are going through some, some struggles and some tribulations right now? Well, they were going through these things. Some difficult times. But yet, 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 uh, 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 they were questioning, like we do, man, where's God? I mean, has he left us? Has he abandoned? Is God mad at me? Is that why I'm enduring all this stuff? Has he left me all together? But, 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 just like I shared a few minutes ago uh, about the frustrations of looking for something that's not really lost. It's right there all the time. See, see that's what the, the Isaiah was trying to let, let the children of Israel know. He, he was trying to let them know. So he let them know through two prophecies. You know, the, he, he let them know that God had not left them. And he also let them know that, hey, he's with you. See, now, that's the best news that they could have ever received. That's the best prophetic word. Out of all the prophetic words that we can ever receive, that we, you know, we look for prophetic words and we want to hear some word. But man, for us to know that, that God hasn't left us and to know that he is right there with us, look, that's all I need because if God is with me and he is for me, it doesn't matter who's against me. It doesn't matter what's happening in the world because I'm in safe hands. I'm in good hands with the Lord. So first, what does he do? In, 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 in chapter 7, verse 14, he prophesied about the birth of a child whose name would signify God's presence. He told him the name would be Emmanuel, meaning God is with us. And then in, in, in chapter 9, uh, verse 6, uh, he, he talked about that child, a uh, child that was born and the son that was given. Remember, I talked about it a few weeks ago. I talked about how, how, how it, was, it was distinct. See, that, that child represented his human nature, but the son that was given represented his divine nature. And see, he was coming into union with both of those to come to this earth in human flesh to endure the same type of pain and things that we have to endure, but yet he still was divine, and yet he was going to accomplish the will that the Father sent him to accomplish. See, See, you have to realize that, that, that when God sent him, see, he didn't just, uh, 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 he didn't just, uh, uh, it wasn't a gift that, that, was, that was just given to us, but it was a gift that was for our benefit. See, it wasn't one of those gifts. See, sometimes you can get some gag gifts. People give you gifts sometimes that, that you that you be scratching your head saying, now what were they thinking when they gave that to me? But you know what? He gave us a gift, the gift of Jesus, the gift of Emmanuel. That gift is a gift uh, uh, that was for our benefit. What was the benefit? He came to save the world. He came to save all mankind. He came to repair uh, the breach that sin had caused. He came to restore our relationship with the Father so that we can reign with him in glory one day when Jesus returns. He came for our benefit. Listen, David in Psalm 103, he understood about these benefits. He gave God some praise for these benefits. He said this. He said, oh, bless the Lord. See, he, he understood. I'm going to bless you, God, for the benefits. He said, oh, bless the Lord, oh, my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. He recognized who God is. He recognized his holiness. He recognized the fact that, oh, I'm going to bless my God. He said, and forgive and forget not uh, all his benefits. See, he realized that God had some benefits that he had received from him. And then he started listing some of them out. He said, who forgives all your iniquities. See, he realized that he is the one who forgives us. He is the one who wipes the slate clean. He's the one who makes us brand new. He didn't stop right there, though. He said, who heals all your diseases. See, he recognized that he's a Savior, and he recognized that he's my healer. And he said, oh, God, that's one of my benefits. And I don't know about you, but when we go into job situations, we're always trying to figure out, man, what is the benefit? But there is no greater benefit than the benefits that God gave us through the Son, Jesus. Then he goes on to say, who redeems your life 
from destruction, which means the enemy is there to steal, kill, and destroy your life. But God is the one who redeems you from all that destruction. He's the one who puts you in the place of safety. He's the one who protects you. He crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. See, all the while, see, why he's loving on you. See, why he's saving you, why he's healing you, why he's protecting you. He's also just, just heaping love all on you, giving you all kind of mercies, giving you all kind of loving kindness. He just loves us and loves us. And then he goes on to say, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. What are you saying, Pastor Charles? Oh, he even helps us to continue to stay youthful. He gives us strength in our physical body. He continues to keep our minds sharp and clear. Why? Because he wants us to continue to be able to give him glory and to do his bidding, to do his will, to do his work. So you got to recognize the benefits you got. I bet you know all the benefits of your physical job, but do you know your benefit from your heavenly Father? Because those benefits outweigh any benefit that man can offer you in this life. But David recognized. He appreciated those benefits. Why? Because he had a relationship with God. See, you won't understand the benefits of God unless you got a relationship with God. See, outside of that, you don't even understand all the benefits he has for you. So the prophet Isaiah, what was he doing? He was making us acquainted with the Messiah. Why? So we can understand the benefits that he has for us. So what did we learn? We learned that he's our wonderful counselor. See, see, his counsel is not just good advice, but it's life-giving. See, 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 he, he, he holds all the treasures of wisdom and all the treasures of knowledge. All that's hidden in him. Look, news flash, ain't nobody smarter than God. I don't care how many degrees you got behind your name. I don't care what school you went to. Ain't nobody smarter than God. Then we learned that he's our mighty God. What do you mean? He's our powerful warrior. Listen, he's our valiant champion. Guess what? He's your hero. See, he's the one who swoops in right in the nick of time. See, he ain't never late. He's always on time. And when he comes, he's coming to make a difference in your life. He's coming to save you, uh, uh, save you from the hands of the, 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 the fowler. He's coming to get you so before the enemy can grab hold to you. He's coming to swoop you on up. He's your hero. And, and look, like, like Superman used to fly in and grab Lois Lane and swoop on and put her down just so ever gently. That's how God does us. He picks us right on up because he's our hero. He's our everlasting Father. What are you talking about, Pastor Charles? Oh, yeah, he's the Alpha and Omega. He was there in the beginning, and he's going to be there in the end. And guess what? He didn't forget about the in-between because he told us that he will never leave us nor forsake us. It's like a father. A father is always looking out for his children. It doesn't matter whether they are little kids or whether they are grown men. He's going to still look out for them because that's what an everlasting Father does. And then it goes on to say that he was the Prince of Peace, meaning that not only does he reign as ruler, but he, he brings us peace. See, he, he, he is actually the personification of peace. He is what peace is. Glory to God. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. I'm, we're just trying to reintroduce the Christ of Christmas to you. I want you to really understand who he is so when you leave this season and so when, you, you, when we move out of this time, you're going, you will never say, I don't know who Jesus is because we're going to make sure that you understand who the Christ of Christmas truly is. Now, the Bible introduces Jesus by many names. And getting to know him by these names, what does it do? It opens up the door uh, for us to know his character. We get to know him better. See, a a as we understand who he is, then we begin to, to, to grow. And, and our relationship begins to grow. The more you understand who he is, see, we're not just telling you this because we, we want you to know some names. See, each time we tell you who God is, who Christ is, it's for a benefit for you because everything he is is something that you can grab hold to and it'll make a difference in your life. 
And so for the text today, our, our main text today, uh, uh, oh, by the way, I haven't got to the main text yet. The main text for today, we're going we're gonna to focus on, on how uh, the Apostle Paul, he does some of the same things. He opens some doors and he speaks uh, uh, three more of these characteristics of, uh, of this Christ of Christmas. So turn with me to Romans, the 15th chapter, and, and we're going to write to verse 13. Uh, Romans 15 and 13, the Apostle Paul, he's going to tell us a little more about this Christ, the Christ of Christmas. What does it say? It says, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. This morning, I, I want to reintroduce the, the Christ of Christmas in three ways. He's our hope, He's our joy, and He is our peace. Let's look at, let's look at uh, 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 Jesus Christ, our hope. Now, now, the Holman Bible Dictionary defines hope as trustful expectation, particularly with reference to fulfillment of God's promises. Now, that's hope. That's real hope there. In other words, hope is the anticipation and, and the confidence of a favorable outcome from God. That means that you, 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 you know that, that, that you can trust in it. You, you know that it's not going to fail. It's not going to fall short. See, see but, but biblical hope is in contrast to the world's definition of hope. See, the world's definition of hope is to want something, listen now, to want something to be true or to happen. See, really what it is, when many people say, I hope, what they're really saying is, I wish. See, when you hear people say, well, I hope so, they're saying, I wish. See, and, and then I wish there's this certain amount of unsurety about what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. That's the world's way. Yeah, yeah. But God's way is an assurance. Yeah, yeah. We know for sure. And look, yesterday in my Advent devotion, I, I did, mine was yesterday. I, I, I shared that each year uh, around October till the end of the year, my wife, she begins to, 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 to text Email, call, text, email, call, text, email, call all of us. Say, what's your Christmas list? Now, her list is always divided into these ways. Your love to have, your nice to have, and your wildest desire, but you probably won't get it. And we enjoy it. It's funny. We look at it. We laugh. And we all come up with some wild things. But each of these categories is a wish list. That's right. Because there's no guarantee what you put on the list you're going to receive. That's right. That's right. It's a wish list. But that's not the hope of Christ. See, when the Bible talks about the hope of Christ, it's not talking about wishful thinking. See, what it's talking about is trusting God. And see, the, the, uh, the hope of God is a, is a hope that's a, a certainty, not a probability. See, it's going to happen. It's not it's something I, 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 I think it's going to happen or I wish it's going to happen. Oh, no, it's going to happen. David said in Psalm 62 and 5, he said, he talked to himself. He said, yes, he talked to his own self. Yes, my soul, find rest in God. My hope comes from him. So he's telling his own soul that was probably going through something, cut it out. Cut it out. Find rest in God. My hope is in him. It ain't in this situation. It ain't in the world. It ain't in the stimulus check. It ain't in the stuff that the government said they're going to do. But my hope is in God. See, our hope is founded in the belief that, 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 that the living God who acts, who acts and, and intervenes in human relationships, listen, that he can be trusted, that all of his promises are yes and amen. See, he's not going to fall short. None of his words are going to come back void. God's not going to speak something and then don't honor his word. If God said it, you can believe it and you can know that it's going to take place. 
First Peter uh, 121 says this. We encourage this way. It says, through Christ you have come to trust in God. And you have placed your faith and hope in God because he raised Christ from the dead and gave him a great, gave him great glory. See, our trust is in God. Our hope is in God. Why? Because he ain't never failed us. He will never fail you. He's not like a man. He's not going to change his mind. He's not going to get tired and say, come back tomorrow because I need to get some rest today. He's not going to tell you, oh, I don't have enough. Oh, I, I, I got to take care of mine. Oh, 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 oh get your own. Uh, I work for mine. No, he's going to do it. If he said it, he's going to honor his word. See, hope is a gift. It's a gift from God. See, see, the Scripture told us that, that Christ in us is the hope of glory. See, the gift, so you got to realize it. See, how do I get all this hope? Get Christ. See, when you get Christ, you get the hope. And see, you don't have to worry about all these things that's going on around you. Once you get the Christ, once you get the Christ of Christmas in your heart, you get all the hope that God has for you. And see, see, despite everything that's trying to shake that foundation, it says this. It says Jesus is the anchor. He is the anchor that holds us steadfast and secure. So you don't have to worry about it. It doesn't matter all the stuff that's happening. Guess what? You're anchored down because Christ Jesus is your hope. I want to introduce you to the Christ of Christmas. He is our hope. Christ it still is also our joy. <laughs> He's our joy. Look, gospel music legend uh, 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 Shirley Caesar, she wrote this popular song. It says, this joy that I have. She goes to say that the, the world didn't give it to me. <laughs> and she goes on to say, the world didn't give it to me, so the world can't take it away. Now, 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 I believe what Pastor Shirley Caesar was trying to tell us is that, that if we depend on the world uh, to be our source of joy, basically what we're saying is when the world decides that it doesn't want us to be joyful or when the world decides it wants to take our joy away, it can take our joy away. But she said, the joy that I have that the world didn't give it to me, so that means that the world can't touch my joy. Hallelujah. Woo! But as a child of the king, your joy, it shouldn't be, shouldn't, be, shouldn't be set on the standards of the world. See, your joy shouldn't be determined by wealth. Your joy shouldn't be determined by status. Your joy shouldn't be determined by your fame or your job or your name or where you live or how people talk to you or talk about you. None of that should matter. See, your joy should be found in knowing and serving the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's your joy. Look, the Holman Bible Dictionary defines joy. Uh, it's, it's a simple definition. It says, the happy state that results from knowing and serving God. So listen, if that's what the definition is, the happy state that results from knowing and serving God, then if you don't know him, if you're not serving him, if you're not in relationship with him, you probably got joy that the world gives. And the joy that the world, matter of fact, it's not a whole lot of joy going on in the world today. So if that's your source of joy, then you're in a bad place. But if you're with God, and if your joy is, is through his source, if your joy is because of your relationship and your service in God, guess what? You joy of your own your way. You're going to be singing just like Reverend Shirley Caesar when she says, the, the joy that I have, the world didn't give it, and the world can't touch it, take it away, or do anything with it. Hallelujah. But let me, under, let me help you understand something here, because this, the definition said the happy state. But see, I want you to understand something. Joy is not happiness. See, happiness is based on, on, on what we determine, uh, uh, how we determine whether things are going well or not. See, see when you say, yeah, uh, this is what happiness is. But see, joy remains regardless of the circumstance. See, see, joy remains whether uh, today is raining or the sun is shining. You still got joy. See, uh, joy, joy remains whether you're going through a hard time or whether you're, in the, you're just enjoying life. You know, you still have joy. 
See, happiness, see, happiness is affected by that stuff. See, see, when it's not a rainy, a nice, beautiful, sunny day, and you want to go outside, you know, and you, know, you want to do something outside, you're looking out there, and you say, oh, see, it's not a happy day. See, your happiness has been now, has been thwarted because it's raining, it's cloudy, it's overcast, it's cool. But that's not joy. See, joy doesn't matter. See, because what joy does, joy still sees the sun shining, whether it's cloudy or not, because the, the sun is not shining through the sky. The sun is shining through your heart. So you understand that it doesn't matter what it looks like. Look, James, this is, look, I know, I know, the, I know the, the body of Christ. They, they, this, is, this is one of the passages of Scripture that I know I struggled with in the beginning too. In James, the first chapter, when it says, My brother, encounter all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but that patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Now, he's always say, what, man, that is just as crazy. He said, count it all joy when I'm going through struggles. Count it all joy when I'm going through trials and tribulations. Count it all joy when stuff ain't good. Yes. That's what it says. That's what it says. What is it doing? It's just testing your faith a little bit. See, your faith shouldn't waver because, you know, uh, of the circumstance. See, because your faith should be secure because you're trusting in the God who has only good for you, only who, the God who controls everything, the God who owns everything. So what in the world are you worrying about? See, if we, decide, if we consider our, our trials and our tribulations based on the world's happiness, we can always be sad. It's going to be difficult to be joyful. But see, the joy that's produced in faith is one that doesn't matter what the circumstance is. See, Nehemiah 8 and 10, it says, For the joy of the Lord, the, for the joy of the Lord, what? Is my strength. So where am I finding my strength? It's in His joy. It ain't mine. It's the joy of the Lord. So we count it all joy through what? Through the power of the Lord. It's not in our strength. The Apostle Paul in Philippians 4, uh, verses 12 and 13, he says this. He said, I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I've learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. But, 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 he ends it by saying, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. See, what he realizes is this. It doesn't matter whether I'm up or whether I'm down. It doesn't matter whether it's good or whether it's bad. Well, all the thing he knows is that either way I go, the only way I'm going to survive it is because of God's strength. When it's good, it's God. Look, when it's bad, it's God. And so all I got to do is trust in God. That's how we're able to count it all joy. Jude 1, 24, it's not going to be on the screen. It says, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with what? Exceeding joy. <sighs> Exceed. Look, he didn't just say joy. He said exceeding joy. See, Jesus is our keeper. See, it says, uh, now to him who's able to keep you, he's our keeper. Guess what? He, he's our strength. Guess what? He's the one who will give you the exceeding joy. Hallelujah. He is our joy. Lastly, Jesus Christ is our peace. How many of you need some peace in your life? How many of you? How, how, <laughs> Listen, when it comes to the definition of peace, uh, uh, it seems like most definitions uh, focus on the absence of something rather than the presence of something. L look, look, at, look how Webster, these are some of the Webster's definitions. Uh, uh, freedom from civil disturbance, it's talking about war and riots. Freedom from disquieting or oppressive thoughts or emotions, it's talking about worry, anxiety, fear, dread, hatred, bitterness, etc. A state of security or order within a community provided by law or custom or harmony in personal relationships. So, so basically peace by these definitions has to do with what's going on in the human heart and between human relationships. 
But the biblical definition of peace goes beyond that. See, 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 yes, it has something to do with our relationships with one another because God has given us instruction on that. But beyond that, it has everything to do with our relationship with God. Listen, if you're trying to find a place of peace, then you need to get God in your life because you're not going to get the peace that you're looking for until you get the peace, the, 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 the one who personifies peace in your heart. It ain't going to happen. Listen, John 14, 27. My, 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 I, I, my wife was talking about this. My peace I leave with you. Now, who is this? This is Jesus. He's talking about the peace that he's going to give us. The, my peace, the peace, my peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give. See, the peace that Jesus has given us, it ain't nothing like the world's peace. See, it's not based on the world's system. But his peace has to do with us and our relationship. It goes on to say, let your heart, uh, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Why? Because you got God's peace. See, the peace of Jesus transcends our understanding. It guards our hearts and our minds. It's beyond uh, uh, what we can even imagine. See, 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 but through, his, through faith, we get to experience this peace. See, and not only that, it's a gift. Just like hope is a gift. Just like joy is a gift. His peace is a gift. Guess what? It's, it, 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 it's a package. It all comes wrapped up together. It all comes wrapped up. And it all came wrapped up in that little bundle that was left there in a the manger, that was born in a manger. That's, that's the package. Listen, let me, let, me, let me show you real quick. And I'm about to end. Let me show you real quick. uh uh, uh uh, the world, the difference between the world's peace and, and the peace that Jesus gives. See, the peace that the world gives depends on having resources. See, it needs something. It, it got to have, you know, I got to have this in order for it to be peaceful. But the peace that Jesus gives depends on having a relationship with him. It don't matter what you got. As long as you got him, you got everything. Then, then, then the world depends on the ability to accomplish something temporal. That means it's got to be something, you know, uh, something that, that, that you can put your hands on. But, 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 but Jesus, the peace that he gives depends on God's power to accomplish things that last forever. These are things that are eternal. These are not things that are temporal. These are not things that are going to end. But these are things that will go on and on and on. The peace that comes from the world, uh, it comes from the absence of trials. See, if there's a whole lot of stuff going on, if there's wars going on, if there's turmoil going on, if there's disunity going on, there can't be no peace. But the peace that comes from God, even in the midst of trials, we still have peace. It doesn't matter what's going on around us. We still have our peace. Why? Because our peace is in Jesus. Then the peace the world gives, of walking by sight, and depending on the externals. See, I got to make sure I got all my ducks in a row. Now, I can, I'm not going to have peace unless I got all A, B, C, and D lined up together. But the peace that Jesus gives, it will walk in by faith. We're depending on the internals. What's the internals? It's your heart. It's your relationship. It's your trust. It's your hope. And it's, it, it, and it's also looking toward the eternals because it's not something that's going to end. Woo! Look, Colossians 3 and 5, <laughs> to be encouraged. It says, let the peace of Christ, let the peace of Christ do what? Rule in your hearts. <laughs> Rule in your heart. What is it talking about? Let the peace of Christ be the thing that controls you. Since as members of one body, you were called to what? Peace. You were called to peace. It just befuddles me how the body of Christ sometimes in some places, in some situations are warring against each other when the Scripture says, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart since you are members of one body, then you will call to peace. How can you say you don't like your brother over here because they don't agree with you over there, and yet and still you're standing saying that I'm a child of God? The Scripture says, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Not the peace of a party, not the peace of a race, not the peace of an economic status, but the peace of Christ rule in your heart since we are members of one. It's only one body. There's one God. There's one Spirit. There's only one Jesus coming back. And he's coming back for one church, not one divided.
peace. Jesus is our peace. And it's all wrapped up. We get this whole package, this bundle, and the Apostle Paul lets us know at the end of this verse what, what, what seals it and puts it all together. When he lets us know that, that it's the Holy Spirit that produces this hope, this joy, and this peace. That's why it's so important for us to, to allow the Holy Spirit to have free course in our lives. See, if we want to truly understand the peace, the joy, and the hope of Christ, we got to let the Holy Spirit have His way. Look, listen, I have this illustration before I end. Uh, I want you to consider this. What's the difference between a rowboat and a speedboat? And Pastor Charles, what in the world that got to do with that message? Well, when you think about it for a moment, a rowboat requires a whole lot of human effort. You sit in a rowboat, and you don't do nothing, you ain't going nowhere. But a speedboat requires power from another source. See, the rowboat needs man's effort to get where it's going. But the speedboat got a power source that the man don't have to do nothing but touch right on into it. And next thing you know, he's flying down the water. And see, the speedboat represents the Holy Spirit. See, that's our power source. See, when you're trying to figure out, man, I need some peace. Man, I, I need some hope. I need some joy. Well, you need to make sure you're trying to get it from the proper source. See, the Holy Spirit is that source that will give you everything you need, and you don't have to try to get it on your own. The question you got to answer today is, is are, you a, are you a rowboat? Or are you a speedboat? And you can answer the question by just checking your source. And as I close, in 2020, 2020 has been a tough year. We've experienced so many things outside the norm of what we, we've been accustomed to experiencing. Things are not like they were. I don't know if things will ever be like they were. But the one thing that has remained the same, that has remained constant, that has not changed, is Jesus the Christ. He's still Emmanuel. He's still God with us. He's still the wonderful counselor. He's still the mighty God. He's still the Prince of Peace. He's still our hope. He's still our joy. He's still our peace, no matter what it looks like. See, Jesus remains the same today, yesterday, today, and forevermore. He is the reason for this in every season. He is the Christ of Christmas. He is our hope. He is our joy. And He is our peace. I'm hoping that you're learning as we reintroduce the Christ of Christmas, who He is. Get to know Him. You won't regret it. Let me pray for you. Father, today we thank you, God, that you are the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. You are our hope. You are our joy. You are our peace. We thank you, Lord, that you didn't just come. You didn't just come to be served, but you came to serve. You came to give your life. You came to restore what was broken. We thank you for that. And I pray today, God, that there's someone today who might be joining with us who doesn't know you, who doesn't realize, God, that you are their joy, their hope, their peace, that you are their, 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 their wonderful counselor, that you are their mighty God. You're their hero. 
I pray that today, God, they'll take this opportunity that I'm about to extend to them today to accept you in that way. And it's just simple. If you're joining with us today and you don't know him, I invite you just to join in this simple prayer. Jesus, I know that you are the Savior that was born into the world. You came to restore the breach that sin had caused. I'm in that place right now. I need you to restore me. Forgive me. Restore me. Make me brand new. In Jesus' name. Amen. It's just that simple. Jesus already did all the hard work. He endured all the pain and the suffering. All we have to do is believe in our heart and confess with our mouth and our life be brand new. If you made that decision today, I encourage you just to click on that link that's there before you today saying I made a decision. There's somebody right now who waits to, you know, to connect with you and to talk with you, pray with you, and to answer any questions you may have to encourage you as you step into your new life. It's just that simple. Your life is brand new. Once you said that, those words, you became a new creation in Jesus. Please do that. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all that you've done. We thank you for your word. You are the word. We thank you that you came. As we celebrate this Christmas season, God, that we will never forget the reason that you came, that you are the only reason that we celebrate Christmas, celebrate you coming down, the divine and human coming together, the young incarnate one, God with us. We thank you that you continue to be with us, and we ask that you continue to watch over us, keep us, protect us, lead us, and guide us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. God bless you. Look forward to connecting with you on Thursday, our Christmas Eve service, and join in with us. We're looking forward to having a great time, 6 p.m. It's only going to be for one hour from 6 to 7. We have a great uh, service in store for you as we continue to introduce the Christ of Christmas. God bless you.